camera? Yes, no. Yes. Well, guys, we're just given a few minutes for people to come in from the waiting room. We'll start in a minute or two. Good. Well, I can see we nearly have 60, 60 people in, so it's probably a good number to get started. Um, Remy, I see that you went out and joined us again. Um, do you think your audio and everything is good to go? Sure. Okay, so welcome everybody to the webinar um, on the DHS2 Rapid Pro Connector. I think before we get started, we invited Remy from UNICEF to give a few very brief opening comments. And then I hope we'll all have a, an interesting webinar. Thank you, Remy. Thank you, Bob. And uh, dear colleague, we are glad to to have many of you join this webinar on Rapid Pro and DHS2 interoperability. My name is Remy Mwamba. I work with UNICEF in the health section, and uh, I'm part of the Digital Health and Information System unit within UNICEF. So we, we all know that Rapid Pro and DHS2 are important parts of the digital ecosystem in many countries. And we also know that strengthening information systems is essential to enable evidence-based decision-making. However, data systems in most countries are often fragmented and not interoperable, sitting in different places. And this makes it difficult for program managers to take action based on a comprehensive set of information. And since uh, 2022, uh, UNICEF and the University of Oslo have collaborated to make Rapid Pro and DHS2 interoperable to respond to country needs. Uh, we know that there the, the, the have been some attempts to integrate both systems using the scope of V spoke integrations, but there's still a need for a more robust and scalable connector that can be transferable to a various country context. This is why uh, we, we did this work. And the, the connector developed in, in 2023, this year then, uh, it, it's for aggregate data and it's part of this collaborative and it offers several advantages that will be discussed uh, throughout this webinar. But I can, I can, I can mention some of the, the advantages that include the fact that it is centrally maintained by a team of developers with your, your commitment to sustainability, quality improvement, and security. It is also based on a free and open source software enterprise integration framework, Apache Camel. And also it offers extensibility 
and is suited for local customization. So this webinar is an information sharing session on the work done by UIU and UNICEF. Uh, the speakers will briefly provide an overview of the work, followed by a detailed live demonstration of the connector for aggregate data reporting. And then there will be a panel discussion. So thank you very much for your attention and for attending. I give the floor back to Bob. Thank you. Thanks very much, Remy. Um, now you've already given an overview of, of um, the, the, the program, so I don't need to go into this again. Uh, just a brief introduction to, to the rest of us. Um, my name is Bob Jolliffe from the University of Oslo um, on the DHIS2 team. Um, and some of my colleagues here will be will be playing various roles at some point during during the, the webinar. There is Sam from Hisp Uganda, Ranga from ITI Nordic, which is now Hisp Zimbabwe, uh, Claude, who's our chief integration engineer. And we hope I've not checked in the in the participants list, but we hope we're also joined by Evan Wheeler and Alfred Mukasa. Um, to contribute in the discussion section. So that's a, give a little bit of mention to Jean-Paul Moutali, uh, who's kindly volunteered to, to provide some support in the chat for our, our Francophone colleagues. Unfortunately, the presentations will be delivered in English, but um, we do have a number of bilingual people working in the chat. Jean-Paul, as I say, is to try to coordinate that. All right. So, yeah, we're here to present work on interoperability between DHS2 and Rapid Pro. Um, there's quite a little bit of history to all of this. I mean, we know that HISP Uganda, for example, have been using Rapid Pro with DHS2 for the past decade. And you'll see, in fact, it's it's based on some of that historical work that his began have done that we got started with. We know that his Rwanda, the Ministry of Health in Rwanda, should say have similarly long history with the rapid SMS and are in the migration process to rapid pro. Um, the DHS2 integration team actually reached out to, to rapid pro through Nyaruka back in May of 2020, it was a year before we started talking to UNICEF, and started some discussions about, about um, where we might work together then. But things really kicked off during the latter half of 2021, um, after the summer, where we had a series of meetings with the UNICEF team, discussing different patterns um, of, of information exchange between two systems different kinds of challenges, different approaches. And that culminated, I suppose, in, in a contract being signed between UIO and UNICEF in June of last year. And that contract was essentially in, uh, the, the, the work was essentially in two parts. Uh, the first part was to produce this connector to implement the aggregate routine data reporting. And the second part was to explore the a deeper use of Rapid Pro with DHS to our own tracker use cases. We'll talk a little bit about that work um, during the course of this afternoon. Why there is interest? Well, I think Remy has already at the start outlined really why why it's 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 important. Um, I can say from the DHS two perspective, uh, part of the reason we see it as important is that we've got a very basic messaging functionality built into DHS two currently can send SMSs, we can send emails, but we have a lot of challenges with that. Um, in particular, countries struggle with setting up their SMS gateways. Um, functionality hasn't been intensively, intensively used. There are some notable exceptions. I mean, the one I'm most familiar with, for example, is the Rwanda COVID testing, where test results and the like were sent out by SMS. It's a number of other cases, but not as intensive perhaps as it could have been. And we don't, 
internally support alternative channels like communicating via WhatsApp and Telegram, um, which uh, probably have a, a important future in this field of messaging. And also within DHS too, we've never had any kind of workflow chatbot type functionality and we're never likely to that's not an area that we're thinking of going into again as Remy has pointed out before rapid pro is used in a, in a large number of countries which overlap with with dhs2 implementations uh, mostly our understanding is that rapid pro is is offered as a cloud service often facilitated by the unicef office in those countries there's some implications to that which i think affect some of our future planning, but we'll talk about that in a later session, session. But the important thing, I suppose, is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of common sense of, of purpose here, both from, from ministries of health, uh, our own HISP groups, the DHS2 team, and also from UNICEF. The activity is just brief summary, what we've been up to, I guess, during the course of the year since, since we've into the contract in June. Um, immediately after the contract, we had a, a what was supposed to be, I guess, a requirements gathering meeting and discussion uh, in Oslo that was piggybacked onto the onto the June the June conference that we have there, or the the, the, the annual conference. Um, happened very early in the project. We gathered quite a lot of of interesting material from some of the UNICEF representatives and Ministry of Health representatives that were there. Um, but there was still quite a bit of work to be done after that. Uh, at the same time, our engineers were working hard on the development of the DHS2 Rapid Pro integration engine that, that um, again, Remy had, has talked about, with initial support in the for aggregate or routine reporting. Um, that's currently been deployed. Um, it's running in production in Zimbabwe since November 2022, completely managed by themselves. Uh, its usage has been piloted in two districts. They've not yet scaled up beyond that, to the best of my knowledge. And again, there, there, there are some um, factors behind that, that we can discuss a bit later. Also, I guess the past year has been has been um, full of very regular bi-weekly discussion with the UNICEF team where we've bounced many ideas backwards and forwards and um, agreed and disagreed and um, slowly made progress, I think, on um, the various deliverables. Uh, at the same time, we've also been involved in a number of fact-finding discussions and interviews with, with various other players of various other um, um, sources of wisdom, if you like, um, including talking to the Open SRP team, our own internal DHS2 tracker team, the Android team. I've had some brief conversation with IntraHealth. Um, also, quite a lot of engagement with our country and regional HIS groups. So, this part of the, of the webinar, anyway, we want to focus on the, the DHS2 Rapid Pro integration engine. Um, that's the artifact. Uh, it's built on top of our Apache Camel integration tool chain. This is something that the integration team within UIO have built out as a, a kind of standard um, um, yeah, integration framework to do all or most of our integration projects on. The benefit of taking a kind of common approach like this and building on a common platform is that those core components that make it all work are being constantly reused and the whole thing is maintained then as part of our broader interoperability work. Um, and that's an important part of sustainability. The other part that's really important is that we are able to provide training on how to develop new routes in the engine, how to deploy and run it and monitor it and secure it and manage it. Um, in fact, we have a uh, academy program coming up at the end of this month in, in Kigali, uh, where this would be quite a major part of it. Um, so 
yeah, we want to develop something that people are actually able to deploy and use, and we know we can maintain. Um, for people who don't know Apache Camel, um, it's you know going into some of these kind of technical details here. It's a uh, open source integration engine. Um, the way we use it really is that we have a DHS2 component. I mean, there are many components within which come bundled with Camel, some three, 400 of them. Um, we've provided our own DHS2 component to make it easy to interact with the DHS2 API. And then through the use of different processes and transformations, we can um, translate items from our data model into um, formats and API calls that can be uh, can, can be um, connected to various other systems. A big focus on, for example, interacting with Fire APIs. In this case, we talk about interacting with a Rapid Pro API. Very important use case, in fact, is is interacting with other DHS2 instances, so DHS2 with the DHS2 API. The benefit of building this stuff out on something like Apache Camel is that you get a lot of stuff bundled in with it, uh, including functionality related to routing and message queues and error handling and things like that, which uh, just make for more robust implementations of integration routes. Um, the routine reporting use case that we that we've implemented and which Claude is going to demonstrate shortly, Claude and Sam, um, has made it, it's based substantially on the existing workflow that's used in Uganda. We started off looking at that because we knew it was useful. We knew they were using it. We knew they wanted it. And um, so we just wanted to implement parts of that in a in a better way, in a way that we would, we would take responsibility for from the Oslo side. Um, also, the Zimbabwe Ministry of Health identified uh, a very similar, almost identical requirement for what they wanted to do there. Uh, essentially, what it is, it's it allows community health workers the ability to submit routine reports from the field to DHIS2. Um, involves a collection of routes, you know, surrounding routes besides just the submitting of the reports. Anybody who's worked with integrations with Rapid Pro will know the really important part is how you how you synchronize and and link contacts. Um, there's the data collection itself using the Rapid Pro flow, um, which can be done either using a single encoded SMS uh, or question and answer style, and with implementing posted or posting of reminders for overdue reports. We can discuss a little bit after the presentation um, uh, how this route in some ways maybe it's not, it's a bit atypical perhaps of, of um, some of the other routes that we might consider going forwards, but still being very useful learning exercise for all of us and hopefully useful for folk who have this requirement. Claude, are you ready for me to hand over to you? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so what I'll do, let me stop screen sharing and I'll catch up from you. You're finished. Uh, all right, one sec. Okay. Uh, hopefully, uh, go away. Hopefully, can everyone can see my uh, screen? Bob, can you see my? Yes, uh, I can my see. Slide? All right. Okay, so yes, as Bob said, I'm going to give a <laughs> quick walkthrough of the major features of the DHS2 to Rapid Pro solution. Uh, <clears throat> I'll be. Um, demonstrating the synchronization of uh, Rapid Pro contacts, the sending of overdue report reminders from DHS2 to Rapid Pro, and the transfer of aggregate reports from Rapid Pro uh, to DHS2. 
Now, <laughs> sorry, one sec. Just me. Let's me just time myself to be sure that I don't take too much time. Uh, yeah. So before uh, I actually give a demonstration here, uh, let me explain how this demo is set up. We have two servers running. One is Rapid Pro, and the other is sorry, one sec. The other is DHS2. Uh, on the DHS2 server, we have a number of users and also a data set configured. Uh, this data set is called H, uh, has the code of uh, HMIS 033B. And we are, for this demo, we're interested in one of its sections, which is the OPD uh, weekly attendance, the outpatient department weekly attendance. Uh, we're going to see in this demo that uh, a user, our contact, sorry, Called, called Alice will will uh, sub will submit uh, messages via the Telegram application, and these will uh, eventually end up in uh, as reports as data value sets in uh, DHS two. Uh, these reports are the the outpatient department uh, weekly reports. Uh, on the Rapid Pro side. Uh, we have, uh, the, the server doesn't have uh, any contacts, it's empty, but it does have a flow configured. And this flow uh, is decoding the, the Telegram messages uh, sent by Ellis and other, other contacts for the OPT weekly reports. Now I'm going to hand it off to, uh, oops, sorry about that. Now I'm gonna hand it off to, uh, Sam from his Uganda, so that he can zoom into the Rapid Pro flow configuration and give us a quick overview of what it is doing. Sam? Thank you, Cloud. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Um, we have a flow that we're using for this demo. It's for the outpatient uh, department uh, reporting and it's just a summary report of just four data elements or indicators if you will and um, it focuses on uh, we, we look at the new attendance for every week then we look at the total attendance uh, and then we also look at indicators like um, uh, the mothers expected on EMTCT appointment and then the mothers that missed uh, their appointments. It's basically four data elements. And uh, what Rapid Pro does is that uh, once we receive that message, it's, it's in the format of, um, we usually have a keyword with um, uh, indicators separated by periods. Uh, and this is quite um, like we used to have in the good old uh, Rapid SMS. Um, which 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 was the predecessor of of, of Rapid Pro, <laughs> if you will, and so with with Rapid Pro, once you receive the message, we typically uh, trim off the or we remove the keyword, and then we begin to split uh, on the period for every data element. So once we split off uh, the, the very first the very first um, value, we follow on to the next, but we can also do some bit of uh, validation. Uh, in the sense that uh, if you expect you have some new attendees and then the total attendance, you expect the new attendees to be either less or equal to the total attendance. So in the flow, within the flow, we do some bit of uh, validation um, such that <clears throat> uh, the user can be notified if they send a wrong message. So once we split out all those um, uh, values, uh, there's some additional work that we do that is well documented in, in, in the work we've done. Uh, we we normally um, the, the the user who is interacting with our flow usually has a, a an organization unit ID that we that they map for their that they are reporting for in the, within the DHIS two system. So basically, this sample flow was intended to just uh, it's, it's the simplest that we have in our use case in Uganda with just four data elements, and uh, we typically just split and get the different. Uh, data elements uh, that uh, we are looking for. But uh, as, as Cloud will mention, um, maybe, maybe for those who will venture into looking into the documentation, we typically, once we pick out these uh, values for the data elements, we, we assign them names that are uh, sim the same as the codes 
of the data elements within the within DHIS2. That's that's the way we've designed it such that we do not do a lot of mapping between the systems. That, that's that's one of the plus um, one of the advantages we have in this implementation that we do not end up building a mapping, but it's done by the integrator. If you name your um, data elements correctly within the flow by just assigning it the code of the data element on the other side. So this, I, I don't want to uh, maybe do a lot in terms of uh, what it is like, but if I may copy and just add demo in my simulator, I'm just copying an example message. This is basically <clears throat> the simulator will just show you what, uh, how the way it has split them. And I know right now my screen is not very uh, good in terms of size, but uh, when you look at my simulator, it tends to split uh, each of the values, you see the at new attendees are 10, the, the total attendance is 15 and the mothers were expected five and then three that missed the appointment. So I don't want to, because we can share the JSON file for those who have access to Rapid Pro, I don't want to uh, go into too much time of the demo, but that's it. I think I can hand over to my colleague, uh, Cloud. Yeah, thanks, thanks Sam. And actually, thanks for mentioning about mapping. I was not gonna go into it. <laughs> Uh, so let me share again the screen here. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, yes. All right. So, okay, we have given you a quick uh, glance at, at how the demo is set up. Now I'm going to showcase each of these uh, of the of each of these uh, applications features. Uh, first one is uh, contact synchronization. Uh, here, uh, I will show how uh, DHS2 to Rapid for the connector copies uh, the DHS2 users into Rapid Pro as contacts. Uh, when it copies the user, it's going to copy the organization unit ID, uh, the user ID, and the telegram identifier. Uh, it will insert them into the, into the Rapid Pro contact. And also, as part of the demo, I will configure the contact synchronization to happen every uh, 30 seconds. So quick, quick, quickly, I, ah, yeah, just to show everyone that there are, at the moment, there are no contacts in Rapid Pro. I'm hoping that everyone can see my, uh, can see my browser, the, the contacts page. Uh, as you can see, there are no contacts. But if you go into the DHS2 users page, you can see there are some users. As our goal would be to copy uh, the users from here to, uh, to to Rapid Pro. All right, I will bring my terminal up. Uh, you can see that I have actually three tabs in my terminal. Uh, in each tab, I will showcase the different uh, a different feature of the of the application of the connector. So the first feature I will showcase, as I said, is the, uh, the context synchronization. Uh, <clears throat> this is the command I will be running to launch the application. Uh, the HS2 Rapid Pro jar is uh, the binary, the application itself, which I downloaded from GitHub. I'm passing to it a number of the parameters, uh, the Rapid Pro API URL, which points to the Rapid Pro server. Same goes for the HS2 API URL, it points to the HS2 server. We're activating the context synchronization feature uh, using this parameter here. Uh, by default, it's disabled. And we're setting how often, how frequent the synchronization should happen here, uh, where I'm highlighting. This is a Chronos expression, and it's telling the application, the connector, to run synchronization every 30 seconds. Now I'm going to run the application. And it, let's give it a few so it, uh, it can start. But starting, starting, it's initializing slowly. And yes, it has started. You can see that it has started because we have, we're seeing this banner uh, here. Now, if we give it a few more seconds, it should initiate uh, synchronization. Yeah. So from the logs here, we can see that uh, Rapid Pro contacts, contacts have been created from the DHS2 users and that uh, synchronization completed successfully. We can confirm this by going to the 
Rapid Pro page, uh, Rapid Pro contacts page, and hit the refresh button. And voila, uh, here we have a list of contacts which uh, correspond to the DHS2 users. Let's zoom into Alice Wonderland, which is the user which we are going to test with for this demo. And in it, you can see some of the details that were copied from DHS2, uh, the organization ID, uh, the DHS2 user ID, as well as the Telegram identifier. Uh, yeah. So let's go back to my presentation. Uh, all right. Uh, the next feature I will demonstrate is the overview is the um, sending of overdue report reminders from DHS2 to, uh, to Rapid Pro. Sorry, from DHS2 to the to the contacts. Uh, now we can assume that, for example, that Alice hasn't submitted her OPD weekly uh, report using Telegram, so we need to send uh, a reminder for that, uh, an automated reminder for that. And to do that, we uh, we we pass uh, a new parameter to DHS to Rapid Pro to the connector, which identifies the data set HMIS 033B, which identifies this data set uh, for which reminders should be sent for. Now, uh, apologies for that. Uh, so let me go now back to the terminal. Let me stop the application. I'll go on to the new tab. I'm going to start the application again, but this time I will start the connector with this new parameter, reminder data sets codes, which denotes the list of data sets that the application should uh, send reminders for. Uh, <clears throat> I will start it now. For the purposes of this demo, I will fire the reminders uh, manually. But in reality, in production, uh, you would be uh, sending the, the reminders uh, in an automated fashion. So you have a job here, and you would be it would be it would be running every so often automatically, and it would check for if, if reminders need to be sent. If it does, it starts sending the reminders automatically. There would there wouldn't be need there wouldn't need to be any uh, manual intervention from your side. Okay, so I've started the application, and. I just want to show quickly that um, that the user that Alice hasn't uh, submitted the OPD uh, the OPD uh, attendance report. So let's go from uh, let's go check the report from the previous week. And here you can see that the report is empty. There is no no values no were entered were sent from Alice. She didn't uh, send her report, and the report as well is not marked as complete. Okay, so I'm gonna send now, I'm gonna manually fire the, uh, the trigger to uh, tell the connector to scan for reminders, and if there are any reminders that need to be sent, to send them to Rapid Pro so that they're dispatched to Alice's Telegram account. Okay, I have to log in to the connector first. This is the default username and password. Uh, okay, there's a problem with my, this is a problem with Chrome, unfortunately, because when I tested it with, oh, okay, yeah, it was sent. All right, so the, uh, I got a notification here saying that any reminders that were supposed to be sent were sent. Uh, let me go confirm this. Let me go over to uh, Alice's Telegram account. And interestingly, they were not sent. Let me try. Let me try again. Okay. Okay. This time I received it. Uh, I think sometimes the. I think since I'm testing from my web application, I'm getting some funny, some funny behavior from Telegram. Uh, but yeah, uh, this time I received, as you can see here, this is Alice's Telegram account, and you can see that she received a reminder to submit her report. Uh, Let's now demonstrate the final feature, which is the most exciting one, I think, the aggregate report transfer. Uh, now that Alice has received a reminder, she should send a report. 
uh, as someone explained, uh, we send a report by sending uh, period delimited message, like this one you see here in this example, APT period three, period five, period five, period two. Uh, so yeah, let's send it from uh, Alice's Telegram account. Uh, I'm just gonna copy it from here. I've sent the report from Alice's Telegram account and you can see this response sent by uh, Rapid Pro, which shows that it has parsed uh, the message and yeah, that it has that it has uh, and, and process and process it as well. Uh, let's confirm this. How well, we go onto the HS two. Uh, we go over to the week, the reporting week, and it's already here. So I just need to actually hit the refresh button. Here. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, I actually forgot a very crucial step. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to start the application again with uh, with some new parameters. Uh, sorry for missing that. Uh, when I start the application, I have to tell the application which flows it needs to scan for the data reports, for the reports sent to Rapid Pro. So I'm doing that here. Uh, let me start it. Apologies for that again. <laughs> That's why I don't like to give demos too much because I tend to forget stuff. <laughs> Uh, so I'm running the application. Okay, it has started, and it's gonna scan Rapid Pro for the uh, for the uh, data that was sent to it. So let's give it a few. I'm waiting this for it to be scanned. I think. Okay, yeah, all right, cool. These logs showed in, indicated that, that the rapid flow flows were scanned for data. Uh, there was, uh, they found reports and that they, uh, the connector pulls these reports in, transforms them into data value sets and pushes them into the HS2. Now, if we go, in, uh, if we go to our data set here, uh, let's select it, uh, HMIS033B, and let's select the, Last reporting period. Let's zoom into our into the section we are interested in, the OPT attendance report. And here you can find the submitted values that Alice sent from her Telegram account. And that's it. Hopefully, it didn't take too much time. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Q and A questions. Yeah, thanks, Claude. Um, I think we can we can take a few minutes for for Bob maybe to ask some questions, clarifying some aspects maybe of what you've shown. If people want to ask about about new things, uh, uh, then I'd ask them to hold on that for a bit because we're going to have some discussion about about new types of flows going forward. But yeah, so we have some some time to take a few questions now. A ah, very good question I see from Paul on how would power outages of DHS2 server affect this process? Well, I don't know if you want to answer that. I, I, um, or I can take it because I think it's quite interesting. You, 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 you demonstrated something by accident there, right? Where Alice submitted her, her report on Telegram, but the DHS2 server actually wasn't running. Actually, it was the connector wasn't running. <laughs> it yeah, wasn't yeah. running with the right parameters. Connect I, I yeah, forgot. So, yeah. so I think that's like what, similar to what Paul is asking. So what happens if the DHS2 server is offline? Um, and uh, the way, again, I'll discuss a little bit of this afterwards, but uh, the, if we were using our webhook to, to transfer the results of the flow, um, and there's some benefits to that, then that webhook would have failed because you know, DHS2 wasn't wasn't there. So instead, what we are doing and we can do in combination is DHS2 when it's online will simply poll Rapid Pro for completed flows, and I believe those completed flows are 
kept around within Rapid Pro for, um, I think it's 90 days, something like that. So, Paul, the answer to your question would be once the DHS2 has come back online again, it would simply poll and pick up the message. And just, and just to add to as well to your answer, uh, if the connector is running and was able to pull down successfully the, the flow executions, but THS2 is, is down and it can't uh, dispatch the reports, uh, the connector has a dead letter queue as well. So it will uh, persist these reports into its own dead letter queue and uh, the administrator can retry the, the reports once the, H, the HS2 is online again. Good. I see at least two hands up. Alfred, I think yours was first. Uh, Alfred, you you people can't people can't unmute themselves, but I just have to click on them to ask them. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Max. I can't unmute them, can I? I don't seem to be able to. Yeah, I can do it. If you click more, if you ask to unmute, I'll do it on myself. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, okay, so I've, I've managed to unmute now. Well done. Yeah, Bob, Bob, thanks for the for the demo. This is very clear, the subset of functions that you've, uh, you've been able to do uh, uh, to implement in this uh, uh, integration layer. I wanted to know, is there any additional functionality that, that was part of the Uganda integration that you left out? Uh, for one reason or another, or one that you did not, probably not necessary to be backed into the integrator, but you think is still uh, needed for a good integration uh, solution. Is, that, is there any functionality that you can mention so that colleagues are aware that uh, perhaps there's, there's need to, uh, they might be needed to maintain that those pieces of functionality in another component to another piece altogether. Uh, short answer, Alfred, yes. Uh, as you know, the the integrated use in, in Uganda is based around this this thing called called MTrack Pro, which Sam knows most about. Um, and I suppose what we've implemented here is is a subset of that. And I think the plan in Uganda, and it hasn't been executed yet, is that we'd simply uh, implement that part, that part of MTrack Pro that is that is doing what Claude has shown. Um, but it would still push the messages through MTrack Pro so that they could continue to use the functionality that they have. I think the important functionality that um, was brought to our attention was the ability to inspect failed messages and to, in some case, edit or correct them and replay them. Uh, in fact, we do have that functionality, but I don't think Claude has demonstrated it here. Claude, is that correct? Through the Yes, yes. Sorry, okay, since we have a short, I had a short time window. I didn't, there are many more features I would have liked to demonstrate, but which we don't have the time, but it's all in the documentation. <laughs> yeah, so is, I think the big feature they had with Amtrak Pro, there's some others as well, I know, but a big feature was dealing with the, the dead letter queue. Um, and yeah, we'll have to save that one for another time to demo it, but it's in the documentation. Uh, Nana, you have your hand up as well. Let me. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the presentation and the, and the, uh, uh, the work uh, you have done. I, I, I just have some, some few questions. So uh, the first question is, uh, when we launch the connector, I'm seeing that there is uh, some parameter there. Uh, would it be possible to launch the connector with like uh, all parameters, something that can, put on everything and so that we can have um, options 
on the way we wanted to to uh, to share information between rap people and the ashes too. Uh, that's that's my first question because I just observed that we 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 come there two times. So is it possible to launch it just once and then use it at as 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 frequent as as we want. That's my first question. Um, and my second question is about uh, where the data is going when it's come from rap people to DHS2. Um, knowing that in DHS2, we can um, we, we can have many source of database. Uh, would it be possible to specify or uh, a, a specific uh, database so that we send our record from the flow directly there? Or we should create a specific um, database for for a specific flow. Uh, uh, I mean, if I have two flow on Rapid Pro and then I want those two flow to send data to the HS2, uh, what will be uh, uh, will be um, uh, uh, the end on the HS2? Uh, should I have one, uh, one database or I should have two database based on the two flow that I used to send data to the HS2? And then my third question um, was about uh, the contact. I think that I already have uh, that, an answer for that one. So it means that when we take contact from the HS2, we can we can trigger a flow to 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 redirect all those contacts to a specific group on rapid pro that is that is possible. Yeah. So thank you very much. Those was just uh, the two questions I have for you. Thank you. Over. Thanks, Nana. I, I, I think Sam has answered your second question in the in the chat. Um, so yeah, it's 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 possible to run it with all the parameters tuned. Yes. Um, just I ran it. I ran it three um, three times just for demo purposes. But in reality, we just run it once with all the with all the parameters. <laughs> so the other question, Claude, was about the database. I think currently we we're using an embedded H two database, um, but that is configurable, right? Yes. Yeah, so we actually support out of the box H two and Postgres SQL. Uh, so we um, the connector comes with a database because it needs to store the state. For example, for the, that letter Q for the, the success log, the, the the reports which were successful as well, and so on. And yes. Uh, you, you can change the database to another database like MySQL, though we wouldn't have, we didn't, we didn't have, uh, we haven't tested it with other uh, databases other than Postgres SQL and H2. Um, and you would need just one database for all the flows. Yeah. You would don't need to have, if you're, if you have 10 flows, uh, you're pulling reports from, you don't need 10 databases. You would have just one database inside the connector. That's it. And there was a third question, which I didn't. Uh, catch. No, no, I think that was the three. Um, all right, thanks. I, I, I see that there's there's more questions building up, but I think we need to move on. We'll have a, a longer session to discuss that we've decided afterwards. So let's let's move along. And sorry for those who have questions burning. Hopefully, they'll still get a chance to ask them before we are finished. Let me just try to now take back. Green. Okay, so um, our findings and learnings that we had from, from doing this, uh, and some might argue relatively simple workflow. Well, uh, we learned quite a bit from it. Um, one of the things I guess is um, any of you who've worked through the Rapid Pro documentation and examples, you see a lot of reference to using webhooks. Um, but there are, and that was certainly how our initial implementation was working. It's the same way that the, the, the current system in Uganda is working. There are some downsides, mostly related to reliable delivery of, of flow, flow results. And so what we found is by actually implementing both, um, both both report via webhooks and polling, we can achieve some of the advantages of both. 
The other fairly obvious learning, I suppose, is, is that human readable text messages are really suited for quite small and timely data collection. I was reading the marketing chatbot providers like to claim that 90% of people read their SMS within a minute of receiving it. Um, so it's very good for, for urgent, timely data collection and certainly for very small data sets. Um, and yeah, using it for very large routine reports, just because functionally it's possible to do, is probably not a good idea to do. And I think it's one of the things we found, particularly when we were piloting in Zimbabwe, that they were possibly a bit ambitious in terms of the size of data set that made sense to transmit in this way. Um, a little bit about channels. I saw somebody in the chat was already asking about WhatsApp. <laughs> um, the reason why we primarily used SMS for, for at least the implementation in Zimbabwe was that um, you know, they wanted to use SMS because they were dealing with a large number of feature phones um, and also had quite poor internet coverage in summer regions. But as we know, WhatsApp in particular is quite becoming quite ubiquitous. Uh, Telegram is really nice, easy to work with. Um, there are, and the, and the good thing, I suppose, from the perspective of the integrator, of the perspective of the DHS2 side of it, it really doesn't make any difference. It's a configuration matter on the Rapid Pro side, which channel is the most effective to use. Um, what else? The Apache Camel integration engine that we that we worked on um, turned out was very straightforward to deploy on a Ministry of Health infrastructure. That was important. Um, it took a couple of hours to get everything up and running, working together with the Ministry of Health IT technician who's fully familiar with, with how to do that. Um, and because it's based on a fairly standard process of DHS2 doing integration routes, we do much more training around, around that, including, in fact, what will be happening in the Integration Academy in Kigali um, towards the end of this month. Uh, the other thing we found is yeah, Zimbabwe would like to use Rapid Pro running locally on their infrastructure. This question has come up a few times. Um, and we know that that the normal usage of Rapid Pro, if you like, has been through some sort of, of cloud service. There's lots of advantages of that. Um, running it locally, there are some cost implications to do it and managing your own, your own SMS gateways. And there's system configuration and system administration implications. But still, people want to do it and that's because particularly as you integrate i guess the system within your your ministry health architecture of systems issues of privacy issues of control may become more paramount we'll talk a little bit later about privacy and how it may be possible to mitigate some of these concerns but for the moment certainly zimbabwe um, are quite adamant that they want to run it locally and that's what they will be planning to do the other thing we 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 found, of course, the notion of a user in DHS two could be mapped to a contact in Rapid Pro. Um, the only reason why that's notable is because, um, in fact, it turns out there's there's other kinds of things in DHS two that could be mapped to a contact that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, always good to do privacy impact assessment when you're doing these kind of projects because there's always some there's always some privacy implications to integration flows. Um, the thing with this one, I guess, is a very small amount of health worker PAI is shared in the contact creation. Uh, in my view, that could be even less. Um, I can talk a bit about that later. Um, there's no PAI shared at all or captured in flow variables, so no particular concerns there. Um, some other cases that we looked at besides this one that we've learned ourselves from um, and not looked necessarily in a lot of detail, but it's a kind of a, taking a broad sweep out there. Um, we know that Open SRP and Rapid Pro as part of a bid project in, Zim in Zambia um, have done an integration there in support of the immunization registry. I'll make a few comments on that in the next slide. 
We see a very interesting use case in Sierra Leone where people were using compressed SMS reporting between the DHS to Android client and Rapid Pro. Um, again, I'll mention it briefly. Uh, we know that M Hero, the M Hero project, which um, essentially at its root um, combines Rapid Pro and Iris as the health worker registry. Um, was quite significant, I think, in terms of some of the things that they tried to do in that, and um, some of the the learnings and patterns, particularly around the use of fire, which I think are important to learn from. The other case, which well, we're actually quite closely involved in, and I think Johan is on this call as well. Oh, Johan's one of the the tracker team from Oslo. He's working with Hisp India on a neonatal hearing loss program in India, which again, we'll look at in a little bit more detail. Let me just quickly run through those with one or two points from each. Um, from the Zambia Electronic Immunization Registry, what emerges, I guess, is that it's a kind of enabling feature, which you think of stuff which is additional or different to what we've done here, um, is that enrollment in the registry triggers some kind of contact creation in Rapid Pro. And that's really the, that's really the thing which then allows or facilitates sending of reminders, adverse event reporting, or whatever. Um, the other thing that's characteristic, I suppose, of that implementation is OpenSRP is now based on a fire repository backend. So um, interfacing fire, inter interfacing the Rapid Pro using fire is seen as advantageous um, in that uh, deployment. Uh, the DHS to Android client in Sierra Leone, I say the reason why this was interesting is that we talked a bit about the limitations of SMS, and particularly if you're talking about it being human readable or even human typable, right? Making these complex SMS encoded messages is quite tricky, but people have used SMS in more innovative ways, I guess. And one of the things is actually supported out of the box with the Android client is where there is no TCP IP internet access, it is actually possible to take very standard DHS2 payloads from the data entry form and simply compress them and layer them on top of SMS messages um, and send them that way. Uh, and we're familiar with this eHealth Africa led project, I think, in Sierra Leone, where they created some kind of gateway program which decompresses and reassembles the incoming payloads. But those SMSs are coming through Rapid Pro. So you might ask, what's the benefit of Rapid Pro in that? Because there's no real complex workflow involved. Rapid Pro is not really dealing with the content of the message at all. Um, uh, the flow itself is very simple. It simply forwards. Um, but where we saw the value in Rapid Pro in there was really the contact list. Because I think by having the contact list in there, they had a sort of way of, uh, of, of gatekeeping to ensure that only valid numbers were participating in the flow. Um, other than that, it's, it's possibly a bit of a peculiarity, but um, it's an in interesting case of novel use of SMS. Um, here, I think it's, it's probably one of the more interesting cases, and, and we've not had an opportunity yet to discuss it in a lot of detail with the, the InterHealth people who started some discussion around this. Uh, again, a little bit like OpenSRP, the later versions of IRIS is based on a fire repository backend, IRIS being a health worker registry. So um, by, by uh, synchronizing the, the contacts in the Rapid Pro with the, the workers in the health worker registry, much like the flow of user synchronization that Claude illustrated. Um, conceptually, conceptually, then it provides the MOH with the background infrastructure then to be able to communicate bidirectionally with all the health workers in the registry. Probably the most important learnings from that project and stuff to look at is, is um, the work that they did around different approaches of mapping rapid pro flows and contacts to fire resources. Um, neonatal hearing loss program in India that I referred to. This one is interesting in the sense it's, it's a small project at the moment, a um, bit of an ongoing collaboration between UIO, Hisp India and the hospital. 
essentially the background is it's it's there to help parents easily ask questions regarding infants progress in case of possible hearing loss um so the integration allows neonatal hearing loss program to use whatsapp as a channel collect data through questionnaires questionnaires with a small queue uh, and then seemingly store and analyze the data in dhis2 those questionnaires are very simple again well suited to to short messaging applications simple yes no answers um small scale 30 to 40 enrollments in, in initially in the one hospital um Enrollment in the tracker program triggers creation of rapid pro contacts. Again, that's a similar pattern like what we saw with the Zimbabwe, the, the, the Zambia immunization registry at a much larger scale. But this notion of enrollment triggering contact creation. Uh, the rapid flow flows themselves, I don't have all the detail of, but they're modeled after DHS2 program stages, which in some ways analogous to um, fire care plans, not exactly, but um so the flows uh, uh different parts of the flow were modeled by different program stages in dhs too uh the interesting thing because this is a small scale thing and i think there is real there is scope for these small projects which are not necessarily huge national rollouts but the question of rapid pro hosting came up uh, it's obviously not something that the hospital would want to do um just to support this particular thing um, the way that's probably going to work is that Hisp India will 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 perhaps fire up and and provide a, a rapid pro hosting service, which would be used by this hospital and then perhaps others. Um, but yeah, the question of of provision of services cloud in the cloud or in the basement uh, is something that comes up um, all over. The kind of flows that we end up looking at, I guess, looking at these different types of, of cases, they can be grouped a little bit. I mean, what we did with the the routine reporting, essentially the the contact is the health worker. Um, and I think you can characterize a whole number of use cases where the contact is the health worker. And there has some implications in terms of sort of privacy and security and 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 just the types of data as well uh, besides aggregate routine reporting a, a health worker may also be reporting data captured during an encounter uh, it could be an enrollment or it could be what we call program stage data um, or even anonymous event data similarly where the contact is a health worker um, there's kind of outward messaging flows besides just data collection um most of which many of which we people may be familiar with and we've talked a bit about in some of the previous cases sending reminders um sending out instructions requests to conduct a follow-up visit that kind of thing um where the contact is not a health worker but is a subject of care or a patient or even a, a, a citizen at large, if you like. Uh, there are also opportunities for data collection, um, particularly around self-enrollment, um, but also self-reporting, um, self-reporting of symptoms, for example, like, as in the case of the that Indian hospital WhatsApp um, application that's referred to, and also opportunities for outward messaging including, again, follow-up reminders, medicine adherence information, test results, etc. Clearly, when you start looking at this right-hand column, you can see that there are more significant um, privacy implications of those flows. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about those before we move on to our final session. Um, all integrations have some kind of privacy and security impact. Um, SMS in particular um, has got a number of fairly well-known uh, limitations, if you like. If you look at things like GDPR and the way it manifests itself, I know in Ireland I was looking at guidance, guidance for GP practices, for example, using SMS. Um, the recommendation is really quite minimal, um, quite strongly regulated opt-in consent, minimum or, or no clinical information, quite a bit of concern for young adults where perhaps messages are going to the parents. Um, and in some ways, 
it's impossible to mitigate for all of these. But I think there are things that we can think about. And particularly in terms of creating contacts, where we're creating contacts in Rapid Pro programmatically, for example, synchronizing program enrollments and stuff like that, uh, we should certainly consider minimizing the sharing of unnecessary identifying data beyond what's required to operate the flows. For example, in that use case that Claude demonstrated, there was no need to put Alice's name into the Rapid Pro at all. Um, it would be worked perfectly well to create the to create the contact anonymously with just the phone number or the telegram identifier or the WhatsApp identifier, whatever it might be. Um, and this kind of pattern uh, in terms of sharing contacts between DHS2 and Rapid Pro is something we want to pursue, probably less so in the case of health workers, but certainly when we start talking about tracked entity instances, patients, per persons and the like. The kind of pattern that we talk about with DHIS2 would also be relevant, I think, in the presence of a, a more built out architecture, if you like, where you're perhaps dealing with a health worker registry or uh, if you're dealing with a client registry, there's no need to, to, to um, uh, share all of the demographic data of the client from the client registry into the, into the rapid pro contact. Um, keeping things minimal. It's about simply sharing. I think what in fire terms is called the contact point, right? Which is just the that snippet that refers to what's required for the electronic communication. I think a stronger concern for privacy um, is also a, could be a significant factor in terms of building trust. Ministry of Health to make use of cloud-based message systems. If we think back to the reservations that we know, for example, Ministry of Health in Zimbabwe have. A uh, little bit more about fire, I guess. Um, there's already quite a bit of history of fire mappings to Rapid Pro. Um, I know, uh, again, probably the most significant work that I'm familiar with is the is the stuff that's been done through M Hero. Also, we know Open SRP have been very active. I think there are there are different approaches, particularly to mapping flows and flow variables to fire resources. And I think that's the that's the the, 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 the central problem, if you like. Um, the problem with with Rapid Pro, I suppose, it, it it's not an electronic medical record. It doesn't have it doesn't have clinical concepts um, within its sort of typing model. So, um, as I was initially what depending on the on the use case, it might make sense to map those flow variables to observations. And I believe that's the way they started out with, with M Hero. But it turns out that some kinds of data collections, you're not collecting observations. You may be collecting details for enrollment, for example. Maybe it's a self-enrollment message. So we kind of fall back on the questionnaire response as the, the, the lowest common denominator, which could map anything to anything. That has that benefit. That benefit is obviously limited by the fact that then that structured mapping still needs to be made. It translates the, the, the loosely typed questionnaire response to more semantically strong fire resources in a fire repository, or indeed to DH to DHS, DHS2 native model. Um, automatic creation of contacts from, from a fire person or patient, practitioner resource. Um, using, as I've mentioned, very minimal contact point information is already a valuable thing to do, and, and people are doing it. I don't know if an approach has been standardized around it, a consensus around it. That would be a useful thing um, and relatively easy, easier to achieve, I think, than, than standardizing some of the, the um, many variations of, of low variables. Uh, DHS2 and Rapid Pro themselves, uh, I guess for various reasons, historical and where things are placed in the market, they are both on the periphery, I suppose, of what's a growing network of systems which are fire repository based. And this, I say, I, we can see the, the new Open SRP and the new IRIS as examples of these. Um, within that network, um, Obviously, the free exchange of or seamless exchange of fire resources is relatively straightforward. Um, on the periphery, 
there are translations involved. Um, we within the DHS2 team are, are actively involved in the development of, of prior translations progressively as use cases arise with an ongoing effort. Um, from what I understand from the work that has been done and some of the efforts that were being tried around 2019, there are still some difficult problems to solve in standardizing fire mappings to rapid pro. I mean, it's, it's obviously possible to do and you can make translations, but to make translations which, which enjoy a kind of broad community consensus and which, which address a broad variety of use cases, there's clearly quite a lot of work that still need to go into that. It's work that we're interested to participate in. Um, we're probably not well placed to lead that kind of work in the sense that we are like Rapid Pro ourselves on a little bit on the periphery. Some of the problems that need to be solved in that are very similar to problems that we need to solve anyway. In the meantime, there are many ways DHS2 can continue to be used with the Rapid Pro um, without fire or until fire and uh, we're not letting that hold us back. Plans with the DHS2 connector going forwards. Um, obviously, we plan to maintain the existing code base um, for as long as it remains to be used. We've, we've talked of a minimum of a year and a half, but if it carries on being used beyond that, then we would maintain it beyond that uh, and support countries who are, who are choosing to deploy and use it. Uh, the other thing we found is actually quite important uh, is to raise awareness of rapid pro potential within our own HISP community. Um, I think um, we were a little bit surprised that, that perhaps um, some of that awareness is not quite um, as much as we would have expected, other than in particular areas. Um, Enhancing the rapid pro contact synchronization. This is something we talked about quite a bit in the presentation, but um, We've seen how we can make a link with DHS2 users, who are essentially mostly health workers, but um, very soon on the roadmap is including tracked entities um, that would be required, for example, for that Indian hospital project. Um, also creating new data transformers to convert different types of flow results to different types of DHS2 data. Um, the other thing, of course, exploring new ways of triggering, triggering those flows. Currently, what we've seen with, with the routine reporting, I think with the routine reporting, it doesn't really need to be triggered. People know they have to report every month. And if they don't re report every month, they get reminded. But other types of flows need to be triggered, and we're looking at different mechanisms to trigger them. All right, so you've heard a lot from me. I want to pause there. Um, and give folk the opportunity to to um, raise questions, make contributions. Um, we have a number of people here who have volunteered themselves to participate in terms of, of assisting with that discussion. I don't know Sam Ranga, Evan, Alfred, if you are there, we can we can unmute you so that you can respond to questions. And I think we can open up the floor again to any responses to what you've seen so far or suggestions about potential ways forwards, future collaboration. This is the opportunity. I'll stop sharing for the moment and I can see people. Oh, uh, Alfred here. Yeah. Hello, Alfred. I, I suggest to probably first go through the questions that were typed. I've been seeing a few questions, but I changed the machine. So those questions have disappeared for me, but there were quite a few questions in the chat as you were talking. Okay, good. Unfortunately, I was talking, Alfred, so I wasn't watching. <laughs> um, Alfred, can you, can you, can you, oh, you say you don't have them anymore? Yeah, so, sorry, I, I changed machines and I don't have them anymore. Uh, but uh, they, they were quite a few questions. Mm. Carl, I see you've been, you've been, this is Carl Kinkad, I, I see you've been commenting quite a bit about the Liberia EIDSR 
project pilot. Is there some comment or question you want to make about that? Can't get off mute. I'm trying to find you, Carl. Somebody help me find Carl so we can unmute him. I think I'm off mute now. Can you hear me? Oh, good. I hear you, Carl. <laughs> That was unmuted. Uh, no, I was just commenting that that pilot, unfortunately, we ran out of money and couldn't go beyond the county as it was implemented in, but we worked with eHealth Africa on that project. And it actually was very interesting because, um, you know, in Liberia, there are challenges around, you know, smartphone use because of connectivity. But many folks, of course, have dumb phones. We had to find a solution that was available via we had dumb phones and SMS messaging, which, of course, is common amongst uh, some of the, the folks in the, the outer areas. Um, so for the health facilities to be able to submit a, a, a um, alert via SMS was critical. And and so, uh, you know, UNICEF and IntraHealth had already worked with USAID on this M Hero um, implementation during Ebola. So we leveraged that work with the DHS2 tracker. And I was living in country then, so that's how I reason I have you know that this knowledge of the work. But um, it was a very interesting application because it allowed that that initial SMS to do many things. So that initial SMS, you know, code we had we had developed this code, and of course, what each each uh, component of it represent the disease and the and the specimen, et cetera. Uh, but it uh, would go through Rapid Pro. It would hit Iris as the sort of use Iris as a phone book, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It would pull information from Iris about the healthcare worker who sent the code, and so you didn't have to include that information. That was being pulled from Iris, and it would pull information from Iris and take it into Tracker and start a pending case within Tracker, and uh, and then it would send. Uh, a notification to the appropriate district surveillance officer whose facility that was in and create a pending case on their laptop on in what we called offline tracker. And that would trigger the investigation locally. And um, and then as part of that process, when that SMS would go out, the suffix was a, a N or a Y for, you know, yes for lab, lab specimen or no for not for lab specimen. But within IRIS, it was coded, no, excuse me, within Rapid Pro, it was coded uh, by disease on whether specimens were required or not. So if someone put a no for, let's say, Ebola, uh, it would auto send back a message saying why wasn't a specimen collected, and then they would have to respond to that. If they did say yes, a specimen was collected, then it auto SMS the the um, the dispatch office for Riders for Health who would dispatch a rider to go pick up the lab specimen, and would also auto notify the the lab that an Ebola specimen was in route. And so um, it did, you know, many, many different aspects. Number one, it triggered the, the staff to investigate. Number two, it identified you know, appropriate leadership within the Ministry of Health and infill uh, based on the case. And of course, you're not going to let the DG know about every case that's coming, you know, every suspect case of whatever. You know, it could be a dog Ooh. bite, it could be whatever. But if it's a Ebola case or loss of fever case, then, leader, then leadership wanted to know. So that ability to route messaging based on disease and then based on uh, specimens uh, was critical, it is critical for them. Now, unfortunately with them, uh, we did the pilot, we ran out of funds, CDC, uh, we ran out of funds to expand that across the other counties. World Bank was gonna fund some additional work and then that stopped and then I moved back to Atlanta and then the work kind of stopped. So uh, it's just sitting there now, unfortunately, but I thought it was a very novel use of of integration of, of M Hero in that case and Rapid Pro uh, with with DHS2 Tracker. Over. Yeah, no, absolutely, Carl. I, I think even though that that sort of development may have paused a little bit on that project, I think there's such a lot of such a lot of rich learnings to be had from it. Does anybody else have their hand up? I'm missing. Oh, yeah. uh, if you look back through the chat, there is a, it looks like we got up to, um, uh, I think at Nana, you, you answered. That was at 440, but a few that came in after that might be worth responding to. One from Egypt, I see, that's asking about 
supporting multiple entry and individual data for multiple users. Uh, we're gonna see that one from Motas. Max, I'm going. Oh, thanks for the PowerPoint. In Egypt, Rapid Pro is already established on national servers. Very good. Um, we look into the de deployment of DHIS, and I've heard of that as well. Using Rapid Pro as data entry modality. With the... Okay, Bob, there's a question there. It says, uh, thanks for the presentation from one Susan Serumaga says which is the authoritative source if a contact is deleted from dhs2 does the sync delete the contact in rapid pro good question i could answer it but let me give that over to 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 sam you've heard enough from me sam or, or claude I can answer that. Uh, so that actually was a gap we've identified recently. Uh, so the authoritative source of truth is DHS2. At the moment, uh, if the DHS2 user is deleted, the corresponding contact is not deleted. It remains there. Uh, but yeah, um, actually that Bob pointed it out in one of our recent meetings. And I think it's something we need to support very soon. That's yeah, I think it, yep. yeah, and I, I think in an ideal setting, neither system would be the authoritative sort of source of truth. If you if you were in the presence of a health worker registry, for example, that would be the authoritative source, and both DHIS two and Rapid Pro would feed off that. Bob, it's good that you brought up the registry because the earlier question I posted points to that. In, in the in the use cases where there is a, a presence of a, a health work registry, does this connector would this connector still work? Is it a matter of configuration, or uh, it's not handled in those cases? Uh, well, Alfred, I suppose um, if you look at all those those cryptic parameters Claude was typing. <laughs> um, when he started up the Rapid Pro, he had to set a parameter. I started up the, the connector. He had to set a parameter to enable the synchronization of users with contacts. And I, I think in a setting where you have a health worker registry, where those details are kept, uh, you would simply disable that parameter. So you wouldn't have that root operating of DHS2 acting as the source of contacts for, for Rapid Pro. Um, and you could write an additional route, which could synchronize contacts from the health worker registry to DHS2 and or from the health worker registry to, to Rapid Pro. So I mean, at the moment, if, if, if you had a health worker registry and that was already synchronized, you would simply turn off the, the behavior that's currently implemented. I'm trying to go back to this question from the the participant from from, from Egypt. Um, because there's a few interesting thing has it. Will the system support multiple entry of individual data for multiple in users inputting of visit data? I'm not too sure. Whether you mean what well, multiple users, multiple users sharing the same device for data entry, um, I don't know, Moz. I I think this might be something that you may have to take up with us afterwards. I'm not totally clear. I don't know if anyone else has a thought about it. Yes, Bob, Bob, could you answer the, the question? 
Um, the, the one of uh, can, can a device uh, be reused by several health workers to submit? I'm not seeing the question. Just read, read, read me the question. No, I'm just reiterating the question you asked. I know it may not be exactly like the okay. same question uh, asked by the participant from Egypt, but the question you asked is very pertinent to get an answer. Um, I suspect I know the answer, but uh, it might be for the benefit of others. Can a device be reused by uh, multiple health workers to submit report? through Rapid Pro and that gets synchronized successfully to DHS too. Mm. Multiple health workers sharing the same device. Yes. Um, I suppose that's... Can I give it a go, Bob? <laughs> yes, I'm giving it a go. I, I have some thoughts, but you, you give it a go. You'll know better. I think that's possible. It depends on um, where the health worker is reporting, uh, maybe what organization unit or facility the health worker is reporting for. Because I think that reminds me of uh, what Bob pointed out. We had a scenario in uh, Zimbabwe where a VHT would um, end up reporting for a maximum of about three villages. And that means if, 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 if and that means they would, um, even if they were using the same phone, they could report for multiple locations. So literally what we look at is most importantly where they are reporting from, because that ties to the organization unit. So even if they gave their phone to their wife and then they choose a different uh, organization unit or village that they intend to report for, that report will be received on the DHS2 side. But in our implementation, what we do is uh, we usually uh, take note of uh, the, the the channel or the details of um, the, the, the reporter. Essentially, we take the the, the, the URL in, which the URL URN. That's if if they're using Telegram, we'll keep a copy of that. If they're using a phone number, we'll keep a copy of, of that. But I think it can it can be used. It can be reused by my multiple people. Yeah, the problem would be. And I think this is part of why the, the GDPR have got issues with, with using SMS, is that, you know, when you open the phone, you've got access to the SMS messages. Um, there's no further authentication required. Um, and so if you had three people sending an SMS from the same phone, you would have to explicitly somehow indicate who it was that's sending the SMS if you wanted to have a proper audit. So I think the case you described, Sam, is the other way around in a way. That way you have one user, but reporting yeah. from multiple locations. But if you have many users reporting for the same location, for example, um, it's a bit of a tricky problem. Partly because you don't re-authenticate yourself on the device. So once you have access to the device, unless you're gonna explicitly identify yourself as part of the flow, uh, I, I can't see how it would discriminate. Don't know if anyone else has a thought on that. Alfred, you had said you thought you had, you had, or you had some thoughts. No, uh, my questions are done. Is one other, is one other participant has their hand up? Yeah. Before you answer that one, I just wanted to let you know that Remy pointed out that we're getting to the end of this event, so we might think about wrapping it up. Okay, thanks, Max. Yeah, I see we are. Um, all right, well, uh, thanks very much for, for everybody who's participated. Um, and also, of course, everybody who's been involved in the field testing from, from Ministry of Health in Zimbabwe. Um, in particular, uh, we we will have have the recording available for people to look at and share the presentations as well. Um, as you can see from some of the 
the latter parts of the presentation, there's quite a lot of scope for, for more work to be done on this. We've really just been scratching the surface. Uh, Remy informs me that there's possibly a workshop coming up in Uganda in May. Um, I uh, hope that he'll share more details with, it, with us all soon. But no, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I hope it's been informative. Uh, and please get in touch with, with any of us afterwards for any more clarification. Or just if you have anything interesting you want to bring to our attention. Remy, do you want to make any closing remark? Are you still with us? Yes, thank you very much. It was a great webinar and uh, well, and we are we are now moving toward the next phase to also address uh, and give our passion level data, uh, you know, which includes uh, individual reporting and longitudinal tracking of health, of uh, health records, you know. Uh, Looking at the ecosystem and trying to to leverage you know existing platform and and and, and you Bob you touched on on some OpenSRP uh, CHT and others and uh, also looking at triggering uh, triggering messages uh, through DHS2 and uh, other platform using a Rapid Pro as a backbone. Uh, messaging engine. So this is going to be the next phase, and uh, we are planning to have a recurrent gathering uh, uh, workshop uh, in Kampala in May. And uh, I know that Bob and team has been working on some some documentation that will be fit into the, the process in, uh, you know, would, uh, that will inform the, the, the process for the, 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 the recurrent gathering workshop. So uh, stay tuned. We we will let you know, and uh, uh, and uh, you will be informed. And also, will be uh, this 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 uh, design document will help us to really move to the next phase to develop a mediator for individual data data uh, uh, level. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, I hand back to you, uh, Bob, uh, just to conclude, and then can finish the webinar. Uh, thanks, Remy. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Max, for the support. Um, I think we can wrap up now.